so as promised, we are now going to look at the question of whether we can conclude that a given Taylor series is equal to the function. So remember that the Taylor series of a function f at a uh, is the only power series representation centered at a possible for the function and uh, is given by the power series centered at a for which the nth coefficient is given by the nth derivative of the function evaluated at a divided by n factorial. And we want to know whether we can conclude that this is equal to f of x at least for uh, a given interval of uh, x values. So we're going to introduce a few notions to look at this question. First, the nth degree Taylor polynomial of f at a is what you expect. Right, it's the partial sum of the power series up to n. And of course, uh, what we want to know is whether the sequence tn converges for to the function f for each x. So we're going to define rn of x uh, to be the difference, in other words, the error that we make if we approximate f of x by tn of x. And of course, saying that uh, the sequence of Taylor polynomials converges to f is the same as saying that the um, nth remainder, this rn that we just defined, uh, goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, and we can write that in absolute value if we feel like it. Now, the main result in this video is the so-called Taylor-Lagrange theorem. And the assumption is um, the assumptions are that f and all of its first n derivatives, so that's f, f prime, f second, and so on, up to the derivative of order n, are all continuous on the closed interval a, b, and the nth derivative is also differentiable on the open interval a, b. Then we can find a value c between a and b, strictly between a and b, it's not a and it's not b, such that f of b is equal to the value of the n stellar polynomial of f evaluated at b plus well, plus something that has to be the remainder at b but that is given by um, the n plus 1's derivative of f evaluated at c divided by n plus 1 factorial multiplied by b minus a to the n plus 1. So there is a c for which the nth remainder at b this C is strictly between A and B, uh, is given by this um, n plus 1 derivative of F evaluated at C divided by n plus 1 factorial multiplied by B minus A to the n plus 1. So, we're going to try to go over a proof of this and justify this result. And um, to do so, we're going to introduce an auxiliary function phi and phi of x is defined by f of b minus um, the sum from 0 to n of a general term that looks like a power series um, but where we changed a little bit the role of the variables so we have the ith derivative of f at x divided by i factorial multiplied by b minus x to the i and then we subtract a term that looks like the remainder um, that we are looking for, it's a divided by n plus 1 factorial multiplied by b minus x to the n plus 1. So what is a? a is a constant that we have chosen to have phi of a equals 0. Now you might think, okay, can we choose a constant that way? Of course we can because uh, if you plug x equal a in this, well, it give us, uh, you get a certain expression, namely f of b minus uh, the value of the nth Taylor polynomial of f at b minus a over n plus 1 factorial b minus a to the n plus 1 and if you set that equal to 0 you can solve for a for capital A and you get a well-defined number whatever that is we don't really care to know what it is at this point um, except that if you look at what that means when you plug a in, inside this function phi and set that equal to 0 and you solve for f of b well then you're going to get f of b is your n stellar polynomial of the function evaluated at b plus 
this capital A multiplied by B minus A to the N plus 1 over N plus 1 factorial. So in other words, here what we are trying to show is that this capital A has to be the N plus 1's derivative of F at C to get the taylor lagrange theorem. So how do we do that? Well, we picked a to have phi of a equals zero, phi of a equals zero, and on the other hand, phi is defined in such a way that if I plug x equal b, I get zero, because you see that um, the last term, if I plug b for x, I get b minus b to the n plus one at zero. In the sum, all of the powers of b minus x are zero except when i is zero, in which case I get just the uh, derivative of order 0 of f at b, and that's just f of b. So I get f of b minus f of b plus a bunch of terms that are all 0. So in other words, uh, phi of a and phi of b are equal and are equal to 0. And under the assumptions that we have, this function phi is continuous on the uh, closed interval a, b and differentiable on the open interval a, b because it's defined in terms of f and its n derivatives plus some polynomial. Therefore, the theorem of Hall applies to this function phi to the effect that there is some point between a and b, strictly between a and b, where the derivative of that function must be zero. So let's take a look at the derivative of that function. Well, when we differentiate f of b, we're going to get 0, and then we have the derivative of this finite sum. It's going to be the finite sum of the derivative, but you see that inside the sum, we have 1 over i factorial, that's just a constant, and then we have a product of two functions. The uh, derivative of order i of the function f on one end, and b minus x to the i on the other end. So that's a product. We're going to have to use the product rule to differentiate each one of these terms. On the other end, for this kind of term, we don't have a problem because we just have a constant multiplied by b minus x to the n plus 1. So when we differentiate, we're just going to have this constant multiplied by the derivative of b minus x to the n plus 1, which is n plus 1, b minus x to the n, multiplied by negative 1 because we have to multiply by the derivative of b minus x. So that means that our derivative is given by this expression. The last term uh, on the right hand side uh, is exactly what we what we discussed and you see that you have this n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial which is going to simplify to 1 over n factorial. The ugly part in some way is what you have for the derivative of the terms inside the sum. So here I just applied the product rule, I have factored out the constant 1 over i factorial and then uh, when I differentiate the first factor I get the derivative of f of order i plus 1 multiplied by the second factor unchanged, b minus x to the i. Then I have the derivative of the second factor. When I differentiate b minus x to the i, I get i b minus x to the i minus 1 multiplied by negative 1. So I get negative i b minus x to the i minus 1. And this is multiplied by the first factor unchanged, the derivative of order i of f. And now if we try to look at what this sum looks like and write out the first few terms. Uh, I'm going to write out um, the terms corresponding to i equals 0, i equal 1, i equal 2, and i equal 3. And you see that uh, the first term corresponding to i equals 0, uh, 1 over 0 factorial is 0, then I have the first derivative of f multiplied by b minus x to the 0, so just multiplied by 1. Then I subtract um, a term that is 0 because i is 0. Then when i is 1, 1 over i factorial is still 1. Then I have the second derivative of f at x multiplied by b minus x to the 1 minus 1 times uh, b minus x to the 0, which is still 1 and then the first derivative, and then I keep going like that for i equal uh, 2 and 3. Now, let's look at this first term. First derivative of f, a little bit later I have the opposite. So these two, term, these two terms cancel out. 
Then I have the second derivative of f multiplied by b minus x, but a little later I have minus 2 b minus x second derivative of f, and this is multiplied by 1 half. So it's actually minus b minus x second derivative of f, so these two terms also cancel out. Then the next term that didn't cancel is 1 half of the third derivative of f multiplied by b minus x squared, and you see that it cancels with a term that comes later, which is negative 3 b minus x squared times the third derivative of f, multiplied by 1 6. You have this 1 6 as a factor in front of this parenthesis. So negative 3 over 6 is negative 1 half, and therefore it cancels with the previous term. So at the end, all of the terms in this sum cancel out except for um, the last term for i, when i is n, this term is the n plus 1's derivative of f divided by n factorial multiplied by b minus x to the n, so that's the term in the sum for um, i equal n. But this term here, uh, as you have seen when we discussed the previous sum, this negative term cancels with something that was coming previously. Right? So this um, term corresponding to i equal n would cancel with a positive term that came previously in the sum. So the only terms that remain are these two, uh, this um, negative n derivative of order n plus 1 of f over n factorial multiplied by b minus x to the n, and then the um, compl complementary term at the end, which is just a over n factorial b minus x to the n, and you see that we can factor out b minus x to the n over n factorial. And what factors is a minus the n plus 1's derivative of f at x. Well, this n plus 1 here in, in exponent should be between parentheses. And so, because um, what we have obtained from Rolle's theorem is that there is a c strictly between a and b where the derivative is 0, that means this quantity here is 0 at c, and on the other hand, c is not b. So when I plug x equals c, this b minus c to the n is not 0. So if the derivative is 0, it means the other factor, a minus the n plus 1's derivative of f at c, must be 0. In other words, a is the n plus 1's derivative of f at c, which is exactly what we wanted, because if now uh, we use the fact that phi phi of a is 0, so you plug x equal a in the expression for phi, you get 0 equal f of b minus what turns out to be in the case where x equal a, the um, nth Taylor polynomial of f at a evaluated at b, uh, minus a over n plus 1 factorial b minus a to the n plus 1, but we have just found that a is nothing but the n plus 1's derivative of f evaluated at c, so we obtain exactly what we were looking for, and we have established this uh, important result, the theorem of Taylor-Lagrange, which gives us an explicit formula for the remainder. In particular, if we know that the, you see that the remainder is given uh, in terms of the derivative of order n plus 1. And if we know in particular that this derivative of order n plus 1 is uh, in absolute value bounded uniformly on a certain interval centered at a, then we can conclude that the remainder is also uh, bounded by m over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1 which will turn out to be very useful because if you fix x and n goes to infinity, m is a constant, x minus a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial are the terms of a sequence going to 0 because this is a general term of a convergent series, and therefore uh, the remainder is going to go to 0. So whenever we can uh, bound uniformly on, a, on an interval the n plus 1's derivative, we're going to have for any n, then we're going to have a way to show that our Taylor series actually adds up to the function. So let's look at example for which we've already found um, Taylor series or Maclaurin series. 
For instance, we've established that the Maclaurin series of e to the x is the power series from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, and we observe that this letter series has an um, interval of convergence that is the entire real line, but we couldn't conclude that the function e to the x was equal to this sum. However, here the n plus 1's derivative, uh, whatever the order of differentiation, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so if we keep the differentiating we still have e to the x, and e to the x is um, an increasing function, so that means that it is um, bounded above by e to the d if we restrict ourselves to absolute value of x less than or equal to d. And therefore, that means that uh, we have this inequality for the nth remainder, but x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial for a fixed x and n going to infinity goes to 0, and that means for any fixed x the remainder goes to 0, in other words, the, um, Taylor, the Taylor polynomials, or in this case Maclaurin polynomials, um, for each fixed x converge to e to the x, and that means that because we can do that for any x, because in fact we can pick any d, there's no restriction on how we pick d, then we get that for all x, e to the x is the sum of its Maclaurin series, precisely the series from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. This is a result that you should know. There are some functions for which we have a standard um, power series representation, and you should know this representation. This is one of them. Another function for which we've established the Maclaurin series, but not the equality, is a function sine of x. And then uh, in the previous video we've shown that uh, its Maclaurin series is a series from 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. In other words, you have only powers of x with odd powers. But now, if you look at the successive derivatives of sine x, uh, it's going to be either uh, a sine x or a cosine x, so you get plus or minus sine x, plus or minus cosine x, depending on the order of differentiation. In any case, since both sine x and cosine x are, um, take value only between negative 1 and 1, in absolute value, we can be sure that the n plus 1's derivative is less than or equal to 1, which according to Taylor's inequality gives us that the remainder is bounded above by absolute value of x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial, which goes to 0 as n goes to infinity as long as x is fixed. And that means that uh, the Maclaurin polynomials converge to the function, in other words, sine x is equal to this power series, to its Maclaurin series for all x. Now in the next video we are going to um, establish this kind of inequalities for a few more functions.